In this lecture, we will be trying to understand how multidimensional NMR works. In the previous lecture, you did see an introduction to why multidimensional NMR is important to study biomolecules. To start with, let us try to build up upon the concepts that we have learned earlier. If you might remember, if your trace of the final density matrix to the observable operator comes up as exp i omega i t, where t is the variable which you Fourier transform, then get a Dirac delta function at omega i, which is the frequency domain spectrum. So basically, this is the time domain signal that gets converted to the frequency domain spectrum. If you extend the similar ideology, where instead of getting one dimension, if you're able to get two dimensions, and you get one resonance along one dimension, it's called the F1 dimension, and another resonance along the F2 dimension, then what will end up happening wherever these two end up meeting, you'll get a peak and everywhere else you will not. What you are therefore able to understand is that if your final trace comes up in such a way where you have something like exp i omega i t1 times exp i omega s t2, where one is able to perform a Fourier transformation with respect to t1 and Fourier transformation with respect to t2, then you are going to get omega s chemical shift in the f2 dimension, which is the transform dimension from t2. And similarly, you are going to get an omega i chemical shift in the t1 dimension. That's the same example that I was trying to show here. Basically, this is built up by different modules where it begins with an excitation. Excitation is similar to a 90 degree pulse that we have seen before, followed by an evolution period. This is what we meant by the T1 period, which when Fourier transform gives you the F1 dimension in the frequency domain, followed by mixing. We will take a look at what is mixing as we go forward, finally by acquisition. Acquisition is what we have been experienced with in the one dimensional NMR experiment. So what essentially happens here, let's take for an example, you have two spins i and k. You start with the i the spin, encode its chemical shift in the T1 duration, followed by mixing it where i ends up talking or rather mixing with k, and then k gets detected. We will see how this is achievable. Therefore, you get omega k. So if you are able to see in T1 dimension, you get omega i, and in T2 dimension, you get omega k, which results in a chemical shift encoding of these two different spins in the different dimensions. A direct application of a two-dimension experiment can be understood from correlation spectroscopy. As you go forward, you will realize that NMR spectroscopists would like to give very interesting acronyms to their experiments, similar to the INEPT, and this experiment is actually called Correlation Spectroscopy, in short, COSI. Let's take a look at the pulse program for this. You start with a 90 degree pulse, just for the sake of simplicity, you can keep it along the X phase, followed by the T1 evolution, and then with the final 90 degree X pulse, which helps you in mixing, then with acquisition along the T2 dimension. Just for the sake of simplicity, once again, we can think of a spin system where a proton ends up coupling with another proton, where HA couples with HB, and the HA proton is going to be called as the I system, while the HB proton is called, going to be called the K system. Since the pulses are applied in the proton dimension, the 90 degree pulse is experienced by both I and K, so is this 90 degree pulse. Therefore, when you're acquiring, you'll be able to acquire both I and K. But to start with, let us just start with the IZ, which is the equilibrium spin state for the i -th spin. You start with the 90 degree S X pulse, which results in minus IY being create, generated. Once again, for the sake of simplicity, we can imagine these are weakly coupled systems. So therefore, your scalar coupling Hamiltonian is going to be JIK, 2 pi JIK times IZ KZ. So therefore, during this T1 evolution, you have omega i, iz. Why am I not writing omega k, kz? Because the kz operator commutes with the iy operator. 
On the other hand, when you're trying to detect the kth spin, I would be writing omega k, kz, which ends up evolving. And once again, since it's a weakly coupled system, you can first evolve chemical shift followed by scalar coupling or the other way since these operators commute with one another. This is going to end up giving iy cos omega i t1 plus ix sine omega omega i t1. Okay, now having gotten this, the next step that you would be doing is to evolve it with scalar coupling. i j i k 2 i z k z. All right, so now the only thing that is left out is the final 90 degree pulse that's applied along the X phase. Let's go back and take a look at the pulse program. So far, we apply the first 90 degree pulse followed by the T1 evolution for scalar coupling and chemical shift. So the last step is gonna be the application of the final 90 degree pulse. Since it's applied along the X phase, the X component would remain. So let me write each one of the components very carefully. If you pay close attention, this is nothing but a polarization term which will not be observable. And this is nothing but multiple quantum coherence which is also not observable. Therefore, only the two terms that are interesting to us will be these two. So now let's go ahead and do the T2 acquisition. Now doing the T2 acquisition, what will end up happening is you're gonna have sine omega i t1 times cos pi j t1 times i x cos omega i t2 because it's a t2 evolution you're doing plus i y omega i i z plus omega k k z plus sine omega i t2 then you have the next term which is going to be plus sine omega i t1 sine pi j t1 to i z k y remember i z will come into the i z operator while k y will evolve therefore you're going to end up getting cos omega k t2 minus 2 i z k x sine omega k t2 then the next step that you got to end up doing is to evolve this with 2 pi j i k i z k z. So in this, we don't have to worry about a certain set of terms. I'm just canceling them away. And the terms that we bother about right now, let's pick for an instance the ix term. The ix term to start with came up with ix with a cos omega i t, cos omega i t2 with other terms that is sine omega i t1, the cos pi j t1. There's also a cos pi j t2 here. Already you're able to understand how the sine part of the exponential term, the cos part of the exponential term are coming where this one has a t1 dependence while this has a, this has a t2 dependence. And at the same time, let's take a look at the kx term that is being present. Why are we comparing ix with kx? Because you're going to understand the ix term ended up giving omega i comma omega i in both the dimensions, which is in t1 and t2 dimension. Now, when we take a closer look at the k term, it has a sine omega i t1 sine pi j t1 cos omega k t2 and sine 
phi j t2. Without worrying about the phase of the signal and all that, what you are able to see here, in the t1 duration, you have omega i evolution, while in the t2, you have omega k evolution. And I'm sure you would be able to recollect from the Fourier transformation. Therefore, this is going to give you a resonance at omega i comma omega k. If you end up repeating this entire exercise starting from kz and following through the cozy pulse program, what you will understand is that similar to the omega i comma omega i resonance you got, you'll get an omega k comma omega k resonance as one of the resonances. And the other one will just be inverted of this one, omega k comma omega i, just inverted to whatever you just saw. And therefore, if we want to plot this two-dimensional spectrum, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm sure we know how the one-dimensional spectrum looks. Let's assume that omega i has a larger chemical shift than omega k. This will be the f1 dimension, and this will be the f2 dimension. And therefore, 0, 0 is here. This will be the diagonal. This omega i comma omega i term and this omega k comma omega k term will be nothing but the diagonal resonances. So this will be omega i comma omega i, omega k comma omega k, while this one will be omega i comma omega i. Such resonances where you have omega i comma omega i or omega k comma omega k are called diagonal peaks. On the other hand, you are also able to get omega i comma omega k. So omega i comma omega k will be here and omega k comma omega i will be here. So these are nothing but cross peaks. So therefore, what you are able to understand here is that if these two resonances end up having a scalar coupling between them, you will indeed see a cross peak. You may repeat this entire exercise without having the J coupling in place then you would see that the cross peaks would be absent. So therefore, this helps you understand the fact that a correlation spectroscopy helps you determine between a large set of spin sets. So let's take an example to understand this further. In this scenario, what you will end up seeing is that while HA gives cross peak with HB and therefore HB also gives cross peak with HA and similarly HC gives a cross peak with HB and vice versa HB gives a cross peak with HC. You would realize that only HB gives a cross peak for both HC and HA. So therefore just for the schematic if I'm trying to draw something like this just for the sake of simplicity we can go A, B and C. A, B and C, B and C. A two-dimensional spectrum, what you will end up getting is cross peaks between A and B and cross peaks between C and B. And therefore, this will help you nail who talks with who and who does not talk with who else. In the case that HA and HC also have a cross peak between them, you will end up seeing something of this sort. As you would slowly understand, depending upon the magnitude of scalar coupling, the volume of the cross peak would be present. And in this lecture, no effort has been taken in order to understand how the cross peaks and diagonal peaks look, which can be discussed during the interactive session. I hope this gives you an understanding for you such that chemical shifts can be correlated between two scalarly coupled spins to get this information. Before we finish up, I'll just give you yet another example of another two-dimensional NMR experiment. This experiment is called two-dimensional J-resolved experiment, in short 2D JRS, where you have a T1 by 2 and T1 by 2. This is a 90 degree pulse along X, 180 degree pulse along X, both for spin I, and then this will be T2 acquisition. Rather than spending the entire time doing the product operator formalism, I'm sure you guys understand a tau 180 tau ends up refocusing chemical shifts. Let's once again take an example of I and K spin. In this duration, neither omega I nor omega K would result in a final resonance largely because they get refocused of this, this entire module. However, during this duration, you will end up having 
scalar coupling evolution. So therefore, for this entire duration, T1 by 2, 180, T1 by 2, what finally ends up happening, you will get something like IY cos pi j T1 plus 2 IX KZ sine pi j T1. And immediately after this, you have a T2 evolution. I'll leave it up to you guys to what kind of terms end up coming. Overall, what you are able to understand from this experiment is that in the T1 dimension, you have just the J-coupling evolution that happens. However, in the T2 duration, you will have chemical shift and J-coupling that will evolve. Same would be the case for the k spin if you end up doing. Of course, this will not be an observable term. Only thing it will do is to give back IY with the modulation over a period of time T2. Therefore, what you will end up getting as a final spectrum is a beautiful experiment where the indirect dimension is nothing but the J coupling, while the direct dimension will be omega S and omega I. And what you will finally get is a spectrum that looks like this, where the difference in the J coupling can be measured basically middle should be equal to 0 hertz well on, on either side you will have j coupling that can be measured and similarly you will be able to get the j coupling for this case as well you might wonder why have i given this example because this example helps you understand in the indirect dimension you can get any parameter that's of your choice like chemical shift or j coupling or anything else for instance even distances that might help you get which protons are close to each other Let's exemplify all this by taking an example right now. What you're able to see here is a molecule called strychnine. And this has a number of protons and the proton NMR spectrum is given as two expansions between one to five ppm, 4.5 ppm, and about 5.6 to 8.5 ppm at the bottom. What you're able to realize since there are number of protons, if I remember correctly, it's about 23 protons that are present, you end up getting resonances all over the spectrum. And some of the resonances are also overlapped. And in fact, this molecule therefore is used by many NMR spectroscopists in order to showcase the NMR methods that they end up developing. And therefore, what you are able to understand is to measure J coupling for these kind of entities would be very difficult due to overlaps that are present. So therefore, such 2D experiments that we have just discussed a while before would be handy. So this is the two-dimensional correlation spectroscopy of the molecule. And what you are able to see nicely, the diagonal peak represents the 1D spectrum that's shown as a trace at the top. And any of the cross peaks that you end up seeing, just for an instance, let us take the cross peak here. You're able to see the diagonal peak, which is say omega k comma omega k. And this is omega i comma omega i. And these are nothing but the cross peaks that you see, which is omega k comma omega i and omega i comma omega k. So what this is able to help you establish is that in such a complicated system, you are able to pick the protons that are scalarly coupled with one another. If a person calmly sits down and analyzes all the cross peaks that are present, they would be able to come up with the specific assignment for every proton that's present in this molecule. On the other hand, if this is a little bit difficult to interpret, the 2D JRS experiment, where in the indirect dimension, you're only able to see the scalar coupling that is present, the zeros right here. And all that one has to do is carefully measure the scalar coupling between these entities so as to get who is scalar coupled with whom. I would like to recollect the fact that in an NMR experiment, the important things are the chemical shift, scalar coupling, that is the magnitude of scalar coupling. In this case, it's three bond JHH. So therefore, if you get the magnitude precisely, you'll be able to say which partners end up coupling with one another. This can, of course, be verified from the two-dimensional COSI experiment. And in addition, you'll also be able to clearly resolve the kind of multiplicities that you get for a molecule as complicated as this. So from this, I hope I have impressed upon you that a multidimensional NMR experiment can be carried out by carefully playing with our pulse sequence and get the desired information in a smart fashion.